Shalom everyone and welcome from uh, Jerusalem. Uh, my name is Eris Soroff. I serve as the president of One for Israel and I'm privileged to have here with me uh, my colleague Yair. Yair, how are you? Great, great. Good. Yair has come to us uh, just uh, very recently from uh, being two months away on the front lines. And we want to talk today about the impact of the war on Israeli society and particularly on us at One for Israel. So, Yair, so good to, to have you and to see you again after two months. And uh, tell us a little bit about, about yourself. So, my name is Yair. Uh, I serve at the Israel campus of uh, One for Israel, and I'm the administrative director. And in the military, I am an armor, so I fix uh, weapons, I fix small arms. Um, in uh, engineering, um, battalion in uh, infantry brigade. That's right. So, um, you know, we've been talking a lot. We had several podcasts, and of course, people are consuming news from all over the world. Uh, we want to give a perspective on how has the war impacted, you know, the average Israeli. And you, you've just been in the front lines for two months. Tell us a little bit of how has it impacted you, your family, and so on. Uh, a lot of people from overseas don't quite understand how many Israelis are in reserve duty. Uh, I could give you an example right now. I just came back from reserve duty. My brother is in reserve duty and I have two sisters-in-law that are in reserve duty. Um, and it's really, it, it's quite a strong impact because I remember on the 7th of October mm -hmm. when everything started to happen, uh, two hours after it happened, I already got a message from my unit and it said, wait for orders, and then two, three hours later, they told us, okay, we're getting drafted. So already that evening, I was on uniform at the base, signing for a gun, getting all my logistical needs. Um, yeah, so a, a lot of people don't realize that I, everybody, most of the, I don't know if most of the country, but a lot of people just had to put their life on hold. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, f two days before that, I was at work. I had already things planned for next Sunday that I needed to do. Oh, yeah, I need to do this at work, this at work. And it was funny. One weekend, I actually came home and I looked at my work backpack and I was like, oh, wow, there's all these things that from a month and a half ago that I didn't even finish. So people have to drop everything and you don't know when it's going to end, but you have to go there. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's really interesting what you said about the 7th of October. I think that's such a seminal day and everybody remembers what they did. A lot of our friends uh, from outside of Israel keep asking, well, how come it took the IDF so long to get there? Now, we already know that some special units got there right away, the ones that were, you know, like professional soldiers, but most of the Israelis are actually reserve soldiers. Can you explain to us how, we, how, how, how it happened? So you it's a professional army. So right. it's not just this ragtag militia as you know, sometimes displayed of the IDF. So things are, have a process, things take time. The order to draft my unit passed through four or five chains of command until it got to us and until we got in. And considering that the same day, something like 100 to 150,000 people oh, were drafted, at least, at least. if not more, I think overall it was 300,000 yeah, at between, the most, which is when, when you think that the population of Israel is what, eight or nine million, that's an insane percentage of the population that got drafted within you know a few days so it, it may seem like a long time but it's 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 a process that takes time yeah I, I agree and by the way for all those watching us you know we are seated right now at our uh, logistical warehouse and what you see behind us is the actual warehouse uh, we put up this tent and there's a lot of actual equipment uh, and that is loading and unloading on on uh, different trucks but um, going back, Yair, to the impact of the war, tell us a little bit of the impact on your family. I mean, you've been away for two months. Yeah, uh, it wasn't easy. It really wasn't easy because you, you don't know what's going to happen when. I didn't know when I was going to see my family again. Uh, it was very tough because every time I did have leave to go home, I would go home and then I knew that a few days later I had to go back. Uh, now, another thing. People don't quite understand how small the land yeah. of Israel is. So just to give you a bit of perspective, I would leave the, my base near the war zone, which was in the area of Gaza. I would drive less than an hour, and I was past the center of Israel at my home. Um, and I would be in Gaza, and in, you know, I'd, I'd go home, let's say, in the evening for a few days. 
That afternoon, I would see rockets launching over me from Gaza to Tel Aviv. And that evening, I would go home and people are barbecuing on their, you know, in their backyards on my way home. And it's this bizarre, like, it's such a tiny country. And even you, though you're at war at two fronts, you yeah. know, it's, yeah. No, and I, 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 we were talking about it earlier. I remember how that is from, you know, my military days when it's such a dissonance. I mean, you're, you're in this hell consuming situation you drive an hour you know and people are on the beach life goes on yep. and so uh yeah that's that's very uh significant how was it for your wife i mean she would she barely saw you the past couple of months she told me something very interesting about a month into the war she said one of the hardest things was not going through the war together with her mm -hmm. is that sit from the 7th of october i was drafted mm -hmm. and i stayed there for two months more or less And, and so we, we never got to experience that as a family, you know, we never got to support each other. Now, I mean, God bless her. She's an amazing woman. She really, through thick and thin, you know, she, she ran a business while she was doing it. She, she raised our child, took him to school when he needed. To, she did everything without me. And so she, she is my hero, basically. No, I, I agree. And, and I think that's part where um, a lot of our friends don't realize that many, I mean, when, when the men are at war, the wives and the families are, are at home and there is a tremendous burden. Um, and, and we've, you know, at One for Israel, we've tried through your help and through your prayers to encourage the women and the families that uh, have stayed behind. This is still very much uh, needed. Um, so, Yair, you know, we, we, we talked a little bit about the personal impact. And, uh, I wanted to ask you, what, what was an encouraging experience for you? What, what, how did the Lord use the, the situation, whether scripture or events, to give you peace, to give you comfort, to encourage you? One of the things that I could say helped me the most, because of the uncertainty of everything, was people that reached out to me and they would send me a message every day. For example, mm -hmm. one of those people is my mother-in-law. So every day she would wake up at 7 or 7.30, uh, she would pray, and then she would send me a Bible verse, and she would ask how I'm doing. And that's it, just a picture of a Bible verse, very plain, and that really helped me throughout the day. My dad, because like I said, my brother is drafted, <laughs> two of my sisters-in-law, oh, yeah. he would send a short devotional in our family group. And, and they probably had a lot of grandchildren with them at the, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Oh, yeah. So it, it was the little things like that. People from overseas that I haven't talked to for a very long time, just sending me a message. Hey, we're praying for yeah, you. We're no, thinking no. of you. And it's really the little things that, that made a difference that helped me get through this time. No, I, I agree. I, I think that's, that's uh, super comforting. And, um, you know, with the, particularly the, um, the soldiers that are the younger generation, the one that are in the compulsory service now, 18 to 21. Uh, so there's several hundred of them in the military and our soldier ministry particularly would send them, the, like you say, the daily devotionals and packages and um, and stuff like that. And, and we hear uh, from them as well how, how encouraging that was for them. So, uh, but tell us how, how the, in terms of relationship with others, how did, how did it go for you? It's very interesting because you're sort of, I don't want to say torn away, but you're disconnected from your family oh, yeah. because of something that you have to do. You have to defend your country and you live with these group of people for 24 hours, seven days a week. Like you do everything with them. You go to the field with them. You, you sleep with them in the same tent, you know, everything. You're 24 oh, seven yeah. with these people. So I, for example, I met a lot of new people this time that I didn't know before, but that leads to them getting to know you very intimately and to know about you and what, there's always the conversations of what you do. There's all, of course, the conversations about soccer and politics and all that, but it really, it, it, a lot of times it goes back to what do you do? How are you? You know, who are you? Tell me about yourself. Tell me about your family. And you get into discussions of religion, of God. One of the big questions, you know, where was God on October the 7th? Yeah. You know, a lot oh, yeah. of- yeah, very real question. Uh, I understand. A lot of people that were, in a sense, religious or so on, they had a very hard time with that, you know, and they don't have, any time to think about it, but with the group of people that they're with 24-7. So it does lead to a lot of interesting discussions where I did have opportunities to witness to people and to talk to them and to, you know, tell them about Yeshua and so on. So that, yeah, that was... Uh, did, you, did you feel that people are, are more open because of, of the war? Oh, definitely. Oh, definitely. It, it also, you sort of lower your guard because when you're when you're in israeli society especially before the 7th of october there was quite a big split mm -hmm. between you know left yeah. and right and those for netanyahu and those against netanyahu and what the army did is it, it sort of just 
put everyone together yeah. in, in this melting pot. And it's like, no, you have the same purpose now, which is to defend this land. Whether you're, whether you're far left, whether you're far right, whether you're sent, it doesn't matter, you're there. Right. And so that really lowers everybody's guards because there's no enemies inside the army. Right. You know who your enemy is when you're on uniform. I, I remember that when I used to do reserve duty, I'm too old now, but when I did, so it was always the best spiritual times because like you say, you spend 24 hours with those guys and, and so on. You know, I, I, I mentioned it to you earlier, for us at at kind of back home in in in, uh, in the base of one for Israel, so we because of of the war, because of the proximity to death, because of existential thoughts, we have received a huge, huge, huge wave of spiritual quests and questions and and uh, people asking and and people making professions of faith. So I think that as the darkness you know looms in. You know, God's light shines brighter. And so definitely a time to continue to pray for Israel, not just for everything that is going on right now with the war and, and so on, but um, also for the spiritual renewal of people in Israel, particularly at this time. So, Yair, you know, we, we've been talking to our people and, and like you say, the people have called, so thousands of people have been calling us and are praying with us and, and giving us. And, and we've, we've found one for Israel in a place where all of a sudden uh, we kind of stopped everything else we do on the day today and we have just started to, to try and be God's hand and feet and help everybody in need. Uh, how did that look from your perspective in, in the military. It was really interesting because because you had such a large drafting of, of you know, hundreds of thousands of people, the military can't, can't uh, ar not arm, but the military can't provide equipment for everybody. I think logistics took a while to, to catch up. Yeah, yeah, logistics took. So it was very interesting because the, the, the people, the, the people of Israel noticed that on the first day. And noticed that immediately in the first day and started doing supplies. And so, for us, for example, we had a lot of um, we had a lot of uh, tools missing to work on the tanks or so on. Or it was getting very cold. Winter sets in. It starts to rain. You don't have jackets. The army doesn't have any more jackets. Everything's handed out. So one for Israel really came through. I connected them with with our logistics manager in the unit, and he already bypassed me very quickly and went directly to them. He, he learned that he can call directly to oh, yeah. <laughs> to our war room. Oh, yeah. I think he so. Could, yeah. uh, he could bypass all the yeah. ranks pretty much, <laughs> uh, which was great for us because I mean we got everything we needed. Uh, my and that actually opened up a lot of ministry opportunities for me right. as well because people are like, where is all the stuff coming from? <laughs> you know. Oh, it's Yair's place. Yeah, you know, it's I, I, Yair's I, people. I, I <laughs> wanted to be humble, and, and one or two guys found out, and they told everybody, no, yeah, you're getting us all the donations. And I said, it's not me. It's people that overseas that love you right. because you're Israeli, and they want to do and they donate, and my work helps, you know, hand that out to you guys. All right. And, and, you know, I think what, what we've noticed uh, throughout this war is that the people of Israel realize more and more that the believers in Yeshua, in Jesus, around the world, are the only friends, the only true friends that Israel has. Yeah. And so, um, you know, and, and I hear that from all around, from another, uh, other friends and other ministries, so we've definitely tried to do that. And uh, some of you have heard me say this, but kind of like what Yair is sharing with us, from the beginning of, of the swore, um, we have uh, really supplied anything from mattresses to different kinds of equipment uh, by the truckload, the, literally every day. And so just want to say thank you for praying and for helping. And, um, you know, one, one other thing, I, I don't think you've, you've seen that from, from your vantage point in the army, but uh, as you know, there's over 120, 130,000 people in Israel that are displaced from their homes. Including my brother and sister and his family from oh, the that's north. That's right, yeah. they're, they're from the north. Yeah. And so for many of them, particularly at the beginning, they didn't have, I mean, I would get phone calls from different municipalities and you know regional councils, and they would phone and say, hey, can one for Israel help, you know, basically fund 10 buses so we can bus people or you know x amount of nights at the hotel or hostel for people that were displaced so that was a, a pretty big part of, of what we did did you did your unit get um any meals 
from from us? Um, I, I don't think we got any We got pretty much everything else but <laughs> okay. meals, I can say. Right. Well, we, we, we've <laughs> yeah. given several thousand meals. Yeah, I mean, we, we were, actually well, we still were well fed on that. Yeah, point. that's good. <laughs> the way you told me this story, it was kind of fascinating. You mentioned earlier how all of Israel came together. You told me the story about the, the Orthodox yeah. guys. The Atos, yeah, so, so uh, I got drafted on Saturday. And then Monday, they moved my unit because we are, our base is in the north, but they moved us down south to uh-huh. Gaza. So they told us, meet up at this junction and wait there for further orders. So I drove my car there. And the two people that came up to me first were ultra-Orthodox, religious Jews, teenagers, that these are the people that don't do the army. These are the people that yeah. protest to not do the military. Oh, yeah. But it... it so quickly, it, it managed to to uh, unionize, I guess is the right word. Bring to together, unite. bring uh, together, yeah. yeah. To unite the people of Israel that they came up to me and I barely parked my car. They're like, do you need socks? Do you need shirts? Do you want food? We have food, we have drinks, we have everything. What do you need? What do you need? And then they point to this giant truck behind them. They're like, we have this truck full of supplies. Help us get it into Gaza. Help us get it closer to the soldiers. And I'm like, wow, th- that was for me eye-opening and that was so heartwarming. Uh, that, that is very encouraging. And as you said, I think the, the previous year has seen a lot of splits in Israeli society, but one of the positive side effects of this terrible war is I think many, many are coming together, and um, and that's 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 one thing that is, is very encouraging. So, um, again, these are some of the good things that have happened. You know, you talk about Orthodox people. We have seen in the last two months a significant increase in the number of inquiries, spiritual inquiries, from people from the different Orthodox Jewish communities, uh, including some that are prominent uh, leaders in that community and um, some that have professed uh, faith in in Yeshua. So we we continue to ask prayer for those seekers. There's many, many, many of them uh, at this particular time. And so um, that is something that is very encouraging. you know, one thing that um, that is a lot on, on the mind, I get a lot of people uh, ask me that, and I'm, I'm curious as to what, what people in the field, right, on the front lines feel, is what's going to happen the day after? Let's say Israel successfully c- accomplishes, as we believe we will, uh, with the military phase. Um, what do people envision, I mean, the people that you've talked to in combat. <laughs> it, it really depends who you ask. Some, yeah, I guess, yeah. Some envision a utopia of, you know, conquering the Gaza Strip. I know that's not going to happen. You can't well, just, we, we kind of been there, done that. Yeah, you know, My generation has been there and it's like, okay, we don't want to go back there. Yeah, no, I, I mean, to, to be really honest with you, even the people in the military, and I've talked to officers, they just don't know. Yeah, it's, it's it, a big mystery. It, it's a huge, a huge prayer point, in my opinion, yeah. that really... Yeah, um, I mean, I don't just want to say something to say sure. something, but I really. Sure. Well, this is this is something, by the way. Talk about prayer points. It's a huge prayer point for the state of Israel. Is what's going to happen on the day after? Now, there's going to be a lot of rebuilding inside Israel, and also I think for the general population of the Gaza Strip, huge uh, need for help in the day after. But the big question is who's going to be in control over there and how that's going to impact Israel and the region. So that's a huge, huge uh, prayer item. Um, I agree with you, though. It's, it really depends uh, who, who you ask and, and what you do and, and, uh, and so on. So um, other types of questions, and I want to go back to that for just a little bit. Uh, we've been, we talked about that very, very briefly, but it would be good if you can explain that a little more. So as to what's the difference in Israel, uh, why Israel uses so many reserves. I mean, don't you have an army that is there 24-7? Where is, and, and then kind of relates to why it took so long uh, to, for people to get there. The, the thing is that Israel is pretty much surrounded by enemies. So your army is already, as, as much as drafting is, you know, everybody has to be drafted, it's already stretched so thin. So for, the, the main idea is that the, the enlisted soldiers uh, hold off until the reserves come because mm-hmm. you have, you know, th- three, four times uh, more reserve soldiers oh, than you have more. enlisted soldiers, something oh, yeah. like that. It's just a massive amount. That their job is basically to just hold on, we'll get there. We're getting there, we're moving, which is why, you know, even my unit on the same day, I was already drafted, I was right. already in uniform, getting everything ready. 
Uh, so I think what a lot of people don't realize is that the people that are in the uh, regular or, or that are currently drafted to the Israeli army, largely ages of 18 to 21, 22, after high school, they are essentially in training and should a war ensues, like in this case, their role is to hold the line until the reserves are drafted. Now, obviously, what happened on October the 7th has caught Israel by surprise. And again, some friends have asked me, and I'd love to hear your take on it as well, Yair. Um, you know, I think October the 7th is, is a day that every Israeli remembers how he first uh, heard the news. And um, particularly because it was a Saturday, it was the last great day of the Feast of Tabernacles. We read about that same day in John chapter 7. And, um, you know, you heard about the terrible things that are going on. And we were all wondering, well, we knew that some special units went there uh, immediately, but there were thousands of terrorists. That was part of the challenge. And I think the state of Israel was overtaken by a sense of, I almost want to say shame, and, and, and embarrassment of how could we have let that happen. And I think in the, in the days and weeks after, it turned into uh, to rage and anger as the news about the atrocities have reached and, you know, more and more videos. You know, I remember that um, I think it must have been probably 7.30 or 8 o'clock in the morning of, of Saturday, October 7th, that a friend of mine sent me a video of the um you know of a hamas truck and um uh, kind of inside an israeli city and he he sent it to me and i looked it up and i i wrote him back i said this is fake news it can't be i mean yeah. they're shooting some rockets but it's not you know and that same evening it was on the evening news on tv yeah and i just you know i couldn't believe it yeah. and um was that was that how, how did you feel people feeling about uh, I mean, uh, for, for me personally normally saturday mornings you know they're very chilled in our home we don't like instantly turn on the tv for news but my wife started getting all these messages from from people uh saying like what's going on are you watching the news today and she turned on the news and i woke up and i remember seeing and the image that shocked me is that they were inside israel yeah. and i told her i told her they are now going house to house and and killing who they can like this is like this is do or die for them they don't care they're inside you know they they got their their they got their goal mm -hmm. which is to really as as you said sh you know shame to to shame israel to bring it it's to oh, its yeah. knees but i mean seeing the overwhelming you say rage but i saw i don't know if excitement is the right word uh, morale how would you translate morale? Yeah, i think i think commitment and and Commit and, and uh like uh really willing to be there I it, guess. It, it was really something that i only see in jews in israel yeah. this 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 need to Motivation. defend the homeland yeah, yeah, yeah. and the, just the amount of people that got drafted from all walks of life i mean i had uh, um, a guy that was an airline steward with me you know another guy that is a logistics manager of some company a bus driver but uh, you know i'm an administrative director but we all came together and suddenly you all have one goal mm -hmm. and that's like that's your goal as a jew is to defend your homeland yeah yeah, and I, th I think that's that's um, it's, it's difficult to explain. Uh, uh, how do you explain the the camaraderie? I think you see that very clearly in the army. Maybe maybe that's that's uh, part of uh, how we can how we can use it. So you know, overall, we see that through this terrible war, God has really brought Israelis together. I think it also brought a lot of people to consider what I would call existential. Causes. I mean, is is my all existence about you know working and and just existing, or is there more to to this life? And I think the amount of hatred and anti-Semitism that we've seen so quickly. I mean, the tides changed so quickly. It it caused a lot of Israelis to be absolutely shocked. I mean, and, and I think it's probably true for Jewish people in the United States and elsewhere. But. Um, you know, I heard a lot of people say, well, why is the world hating, hates us so much? It was very interesting because 
one of the things that we started doing after a few weeks at reserves was we started talking about what country we're going to fly to after we're done. And it was very interesting because... Like for, for vacation, you mean? Yeah, yeah, for, oh, vacation, like for vacation. To clear our head a bit, to oh, be yeah. with our right, family right, right, and right. so on. So, and as the reserve went on, that list got smaller and smaller of, <laughs> of, of, of where we so really sad, felt safe. Yeah, and it was yeah. very interesting because I was talking to my wife and at first I said, maybe let's go here. And then after a week, I would tell her, listen, I, I don't think I'm going <laughs> to feel safe there. My, there. my child is going to walk with me. He's going to say something in Hebrew. And you oh, don't know who that's going to oh, be. Yeah, yeah, and it's, I agree. It's terrifying. So, I mean, to me, that really showed. And I told my wife, listen, the only place for us is here. This is the only place that we have. Well, it, it's too bad you can't find a place in any hotel because it's all the full of displaced <laughs> people at this time. But, but um, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that... You know, that realization helped a lot of... Because we, we all grew up on, on stories of our grandparents or great-grandparents that they've experienced anti-Semitism, you know, in the Holocaust and, 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 and wherever they came from. But when you grow up here, it's like, wow, we don't, we don't have that. And if they try to do that to us, we'll respond, you know. You, you don't... And so I think that's, that's, a, that's a first for, for a lot of Israelis at that magnitude. It's, it's a wake-up call. It's definitely it's, a wake-up call. And, and I think that... You know, by the way, this is my, my opinion. The source of hatred towards Israel and anti-Semitism is spiritual. It's really not about Israel. It's about the God of Israel. And so I think that slowly this, this is penetrating into hearts of Jewish people and Israeli people that by and large, many of them live their life like there is no God. But um, we're, we're starting to see that this is changing. So it's, it's really interesting to observe. It's, it's the, really the question of why do they hate me? Absolutely. I'm just defending myself. What have I done to them? Uh, yeah, and it's really turned the world into black or white. You know, you're it has. with or without, you know, for or yeah. against. Yeah. yeah, so anyway, I, I was just recently uh, somewhere else and, and you know, I, I landed, um, it was, it was um, you know, somewhere in the United States and, um, you know, the, the city I landed in had had a demonstration that day. I mean, I, I didn't see it. Somebody somebody told me a demonstration, um, you know, basically against Israel. And I was like, wow, I can't believe that happens here. I just couldn't believe it. That's a, yeah. a very, very, very awkward and strange feeling. So, um, you know, just um, as we look through the season ahead of us, uh, for us at One for Israel, and I think generally in the land of Israel, what we are seeing is that we want to increase the help we give our people. Um, and through your help, through your support, through your prayers, there's a lot of doors that are opening up that people know that we are giving unconditionally. We're giving them this cup of cold water in the name of Yeshua from our friends that love Israel and pray for Israel in different parts of the world. So um, it's very important for me to thank you and to let you know that this is what's taking place. Um, I think there's going to be a huge, 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 huge need for help once the war is over. I mean, we're going to continue to do what we do. It looks like it's going to uh, carry on for several more months. It doesn't look like it's going to end anytime soon. Uh, we do ask for your help for our troops. You know, Israel is a very small country. And as we hear, you know, just, just uh, yesterday we heard about... Um, 10 soldiers, some of them senior officers that were uh, killed in action. Israel is a small country. And many of us know family members and friends of friends that this is their relative. So just pray with, uh, you know, as we cry with those who cry and as we um, suffer with those who suffer, just want to bring them comfort and encouragement uh, at this time. And remember the many families that are back home while they're uh, dear ones are on the front lines. This is a huge uh, prayer need as well. And also pray for the day after. I think that, um, again, we just pray for wisdom for our leaders, for our government. We pray that, uh, you know, as the pressure on the Israeli government from even from friendly governments increases day by day, we just really pray for our leadership um, here in the land, both military leadership and political leadership uh, for wisdom from God at this time. So we definitely ask for your prayers. Um, there are still a lot of questions. There are a lot of questions that many people in Israel and many friends around the world ask in regards to how could this happen, how things were not better prepared, what's going to happen inside of Israel in the day after. These are questions that um, 
still to be answered and we want to uh, do our part as we pray and as we encourage those that are um, engaged in the front lines. So, um, Yair, I don't know if you have any additional thoughts or, or um, again, prayer requests, things that you would like to, to share. I, th I think another thing is that a lot of people are forgetting the North. The North yeah, is Northern constantly frontier. under attack as well. I have family up there. My brother is serving there with the artillery up North. And a lot of the focus is on Gaza, but yeah. that's heating up as well. Um, so, I mean, we, yeah, <laughs> that's... For sure. So, I, I actually, uh, we were talking about that earlier today. Uh, some family members uh, have been drafted uh, to the north. And so, we don't really know what's going to happen there. There's no question that, um, you know, the Hezbollah over there has 150,000 missiles pointing at at israel i mean distances are very small as you mentioned and so that's something that is very uh, still very much a a real threat so um very very shortly you're gonna uh, we're gonna display a qr code if you scan the qr code with your camera it will take you straight to one for israel website and over there if you so choose uh you're welcome to uh give financially to support us as we serve our people at this day and this time. Um, and we briefly mentioned some of the things that we're able to do um, uh, now for our people, for our nation, for our troops, for our people back home, practically and in terms of the gospel. Uh, one last uh, but very, very, very important per item. There's still about 140 people that are kidnapped in the Gaza Strip. Now, these are civilians. These are not soldiers. These are not prisoners of war. These are civilians, elderly, women, children, uh, young people that um, are held against any and every international treaty of any sort uh, in inhumane conditions. Their only crime was being Israeli or being oh, yeah. in Israel. Oh, being Some in Israel. Some of them are even Israeli. And yep. that's true. And so yeah. we would very, very, very much ask you uh, your continued prayers for their, for them, and especially for the, and and for their family members, and especially for their quick release. This is a huge, huge thing. Um, may I also add um, another prayer request? And this is for our staff and students. So quite a few of our staff and our students, including many, many others, uh, other believers in Yeshua, have been drafted uh, to the IDF and are serving right now in the front lines in different roles. So I pray for all of our soldiers, but especially for those that um, are followers of Yeshua. Uh, there's been three Messianic soldiers that have been, uh, that fo uh, fell in action already in the war, and uh, at least one, maybe more, but at least one that was severely wounded. So we are definitely praying for them and ask for your prayers and help as well. So, as we uh, prepare to, uh, to dismiss, uh, I want to thank you for joining us. And um, we'd like to close in prayer. So I want to invite you to uh, pray with me. So will you bow your heads and hearts with me? Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we've uh, spoken, however briefly, about many, many, many things. And as we continue to gaze at the war and, and the world just seem to, to go in absolutely crazy. We, we just look up to you and we are so encouraged as we look at your word. We see that the world is lining up exactly as you've said in your word thousands of years ago. And we declare that we believe in you. You are the God of eternity. We ask for wisdom to continue to be your hands and your feet and your mouth at this time uh, here in the land of Israel and um, Lord pray for all of our uh, viewers and listeners that you'll be with them that you will bless them and encourage them and lead them how they can pray how they can give how they can participate in in um, in the current situation so we just want to uh, lift all that up to you we pray for um, especially want to remember the uh, hostages and just really pray Lord that you will move quickly in miraculous way to release them. We pray for their family members. We pray for the family members of um, those that have fallen in action, those that lost their lives through, throughout this tragedy. So just be with them, encourage them. We pray that you will continue to open hearts and open eyes in Israel uh, at this time. So we just uh, bless you and we thank you. Help us to remain faithful to your word in Yeshua's name. Amen. 
Amen. Thank you and may God bless you.